Hi, and welcome to the Focus on Eye Health Expert Series. I'm Jeff Todd, President and CEO at Prevent Blindness. Here at Prevent Blindness, we're excited that not one, but two solar eclipses will be viewable from the U.S. in the coming months. These are spectacular events to watch, but they can also lead to some incredible photographs. Joining me today is photographer and storytelling keynote speaker, John Carmichael. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, John. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate you all reaching out and, and having me be a part of this because I think it's much more important than people realize. People think they know how to be safe viewing an eclipse and keep their camera equipment safe and their smartphones safe, but uh, you don't know what you don't know, right? <laughs> There's a lot of things yeah. that you wouldn't normally think about. So yeah, I'm really honored to be a part of this. So thank you. So your your biography notes that you specialize in astrophotography, contemporary art. Could you talk about what that is and what drew you to that style of photography? My real passion deep down was always landscape and that I was always doing that on the side as sort of a hobby. And then eventually I learned what astrophotography was, which is, you know, shooting the night sky. And there's, it's a whole, there's 10 different genres just inside of that genre, you know, and, and I just, as soon as I realized I can merge my passion for astronomy with photography, that was it. I mean, my social life essentially ended. <laughs> and I was constantly uh, out in the desert, you know, away from light pollution and, you know, really trying to hone my skills. And it took many years. And and uh, yeah, and I, I just, uh, I, I don't know, there's something about it. I never viewed it as artwork for many years. It was more of, I was using my camera as simply a tool to be able to see the things I wanted to see that you can't see with the naked eye. That's what I love about photography. So, so that sort of turned into uh, through these series of coincidental wonderful events. Uh, I received some collectors that collect started collecting some of my prints, and and so I, I sort of transitioned from the corporate photography and political stuff to the fine art world. And now I um, I'm really honored that I I. I'm invited to give a lot of keynote speeches now. There's a lot of really crazy stories behind some of these images over the years. So a lot of people uh, enjoy hearing some of these stories. <laughs> In 2017, you took what has become a famous photograph of the total eclipse from an, air from an airplane on a commercial flight. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? I suddenly got this idea you know, because I kept wondering, what do you do for this once in a lifetime moment? The first solar eclipse to sweep across the U.S. in 99 years, you know, it was it's a lot of pressure as a photographer. And it was the most photographed moment in human history. I mean, millions, tens of millions of people are, you know, taking photos. And, um, you know, how do you get a unique shot of something that everybody around the country is photographing, even though it wasn't really about that at the time? But um, and then I just kept wondering if I could get up high enough in the sky, could you actually see the shape of the moon's shadow moving across the Earth's surface at 2,000 miles per hour? I mean, that, I just selfishly, I wanted to witness that. I wanted to see that. And I, I could not get that out of my mind. So since I had that thought of being on an airplane, I'm like, okay, that's what I'm doing for sure. I, my, I got all these friends involved too, and uh, they finally picked... Uh, somebody found me uh, one flight on Southwest Airlines. There was literally one seat left on the flight, and it was going from Portland, Oregon to St. Louis, Missouri. And if you look at the maps of the moon shadow, the flight plan itself was the moon shadow path. My next goal is to find the cleanest window on the airplane. So it's really hard to take a good, sharp, you know, high quality photo from these airplane windows because there's these layers of plastic. It can be smudgy and dirty. There's scratches, you know, and there's these layers of plastic that kind of warp the image a bit. And um, I run back to the front of the plane. I said, you guys, I can't shoot out of any of these windows. The outside of the plane is, you know, filthy, dirty. <laughs> and they said, the captain overheard me. And he said, hold on, why don't you sit in the front uh, on the left side of the plane? I think I might be able to clean your window. So the captain himself gets the cleaning supplies out of the cockpit. He gets out of the plane using the moving. Yeah, he gets, you know, the moving jetway thing you get on the plane with. He gets on there and he reaches over and he washes my window from the outside of the plane. I mean, it was just 
unbelievable. And, and now I just keep thinking I might as well ask for more. This is going so well. <laughs> so, so I was sort of collaborating with the captain. I said, okay, look, I've been looking forward to this for 20 years since I was 12 years old. And I really want to make it look like we're in space because the moon shadow not only is going to be cast onto the earth's surface beneath us, but it's also going to be above us. We're going to be kind of sandwiched in because it's going to black out the earth's atmosphere. So it's going to look like we're in space. So I need to get at least 180 degree view of the earth. So I need to do what's called a photographic mosaic. And you take a bunch of photos, like a giant puzzle and put them together later, which took me an entire year to put together. Um, anyway, I'm trying to explain all this to the captain. I said, so is there any way you could sort of turn the plane around when we're in the moon shadows? <laughs> He's like, uh, I would have to get approval by the FAA to do that on the fly. No pun intended. He contacted air traffic control and they gave him approval to turn the plane around. And he did a practice turn at first, a few minutes before totality started. And then I noticed he wasn't turning the plane enough and I wasn't getting enough of the earth in and the eclipse was too high up and it was getting kind of warped in the layers of plastic in the window and all these things. Obviously it's out of my hands now, but all of a sudden I'm in the front row and the, the jump seat, the two flight attendants are sitting in the jump seat facing me. They get a call from the captain and they said, um, John, the captain wants to know how was that turn? I'm like, are you kidding me? This is actually my private charter jet <laughs> that I wanted so badly. I'm like, well, since you're asking, it, it wasn't good enough. He said it wasn't good enough. It's got to be a sharper turn. So he gets approval again by air traffic control to climb up another 4,000 wow. feet. Yeah. 4,000 feet higher at 39,000 feet. Cause, and he turned the plane around five different times, much sharper too. Cause if you turn a plane sharp enough, you start to lose altitude. So he turned the plane around five different times while we're inside the moon shadow. And uh, it was just the craziest moment. I mean, I had three cameras going at one suction cup here, you know, and I, I was basically utilizing everything I've ever learned in photography for these three minutes, you know, of totality and uh, spent yeah hundreds of hours on it, a um, thousand photos or so that uh, I was rushing actually to get it in, done in time for the one year anniversary. And that's when we, you know, released it publicly for the first time. And I actually unveiled it in front of every Twitter employee in the world, 5,000 Twitter employees, you know, uh, and Jack Dorsey, the, you know, the original CEO invited me to share the story in front of his entire company from 47 offices, you know, around the world, everybody in one place. It was really insane and um and anyway so that i i just count my lucky stars all the time so john at prevent blindness our primary safety message about watching eclipses is to never look at one without the proper eye protection except during the brief moment of totality when the sun's light is completely blocked by the sun uh, we've also partnered with companies for the manufacture of solar eclipse glasses that meet the appropriate safety requirements that anyone can purchase at preventblindness.org. Um, and so similarly, when photographing an eclipse, we remind people never to look at the sun through an optical viewfinder of a camera except during the totality. Can you explain that a little bit for our audience? What kind of cameras have optical viewfinders? Sure. Yes. Uh, so there's two types. Basically, there's uh, an SLR camera, which means single lens reflex, and uh, a mirrorless single lens reflex. Uh, mirrorless is becoming more common. A non-mirrorless or mirrored uh, camera is basically uh, when you're looking through the little viewfinder, you're actually looking through the lens itself through a few you know, different mirrors that are angled in different ways. And so that's kind of like how a telescope works. And um, so you're actually seeing what's truly there. Uh, now, that's the number one thing you shouldn't do is look at the sun through a viewfinder because, you know, think about back when you're kids and you have a magnifying glass, you know, and you're burning a leaf, you know, on the sidewalk or whatever imagine doing that to your eyeball you know there's all these optics and and pieces of glass you know that are magnifying the, the power of the sun and so you do not want to uh do that and 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 look up uh and so but at the same time even if you have a mirrorless camera 
a mirrorless means there's no mirrors. And so the lens is directly hitting the sensor of the camera, which is, you know, what creates the camera, right? Or back in the day, it would have been, you know, directly hitting the film. Um, but even so, because a lot of people might use their live view feature, you know, and look at their digital screen while they're pointing it to the sun, you are severely damaging the sensor of your camera. And, you know, if you're some, some of these cameras are thousands of dollars, right? And you're just gonna basically cause blindness to your own uh, own sensor. I mean, the cameras work exactly like our eyes work. That's how cameras were invented by studying the eyes, you know? So, um, so it's all very similar. So you wanna treat the camera exactly how you would treat your own eyes. Um, yeah. That looks very helpful. Um, so photographers of all levels will be trying to take pictures and videos of the eclipse. Um, the vast majority, including myself, will be using our iPhones or other smartphones. What kind of advice can you give people about safely taking photos or videos of an eclipse with their smartphone camera? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely going to be the most common, right? Um, so it, it works the same way. Again, even if you're using a, a little, excuse me, a little phone like this, right? You've got now, now phones have these three cameras on them. Most of them, you know, it's come a long way, right? But even one of these is also a telephoto lens and it works the exact same way as an SLR camera. Um, so you want to protect that as well. So you absolutely do not want to point it at the sun, even though it's just your phone, it doesn't seem like it would cause any damage you're still causing damage to the sensor. So what I recommend, well, there's a few things I recommend. First of all, you wanna protect that sensor. Camera phones are not cheap these days, right? This is like a thousand dollars for an iPhone. So you want to always have an, an actual solar filter over your camera. You could even use Eclipse glasses, you know, and they're gonna be handing those out, you know, like crazy. So. Even just putting Eclipse glasses over your over your phone it would help. So you're you know the sun is so bright. Even pointing it, you're not going to see anything anyway until it gets to totality. Then of course take the glasses off and all that. Um, and I you know there's a lot of different apps you can download. I I think there's one called uh, Solar Snap. Uh, specifically for eclipses, and another one called Long Exposure Mode. So there's a whole nother rabbit hole you can go down on learning how to actually use this to its full advantage when you're shooting a, an eclipse. Um, the thing is once totality starts, you know, once uh, it's fully blocked, it's, it's actually a million times fainter than the, well, the Corona, I should say, the atmosphere of the sun is a million times fainter than the actual surface of the sun. Um, so before totality, even at 99.9% .9 totality, it's 10,000 times brighter than 100% totality. It's literally a night and day difference. So you do not want to take the filter off or anything like that until it's full totality. So um, I also recommend having a tripod. I recommend learning some apps, downloading some apps. A lot of phones now come with different ways to manually use the camera or set it on a timer. I really recommend practicing first before the eclipse starts, kind of setting it on a timer or at least like having it lined up next to you on a tripod so you can just briefly take some photos and just enjoy, you know, be present. That's um, what I think is, you know, you go to a concert and everybody's, you know, has their phones up and stuff. I'm like, you can, you can watch that on YouTube later. Just enjoy the moment, you know, so... I, I really, really encourage people to, even though it's ironic coming from <laughs> me uh, as, an, uh, as a photographer, but I really recommend not focusing on taking the photos because it's only a few minutes long if you're lucky. And it's the most incredible thing. It's the only time in your life you can actually look at the sun with your naked eye and you see you know, these prominences and solar flares and you actually see the atmosphere of the sun and its different shapes and whatnot and the magnetic field. I mean, it is just, I mean, it's like seeing the eyes of God. Like it's just 
truly the meaning of awestruck and awesome, right? So you don't want to just be stuck on your phone doing that. And in my opinion, I just, yeah. So, but there's a way to do both. And certainly, you know, you're right. People should enjoy the experience and there are going to be plenty of photographs, including yours, that people can look look for um, to share and to enjoy. Um, but what I'm hearing about the um, the smartphone cameras basically is just, just like you said, treat them just like your eye. Make sure that you're protecting them. It, yeah. Um, yeah. Great. And so um, what recommend, recommendations do you have for amateur photographers or enthusiasts who are bringing dedicated cameras as opposed to a smartphone with them to the Eclipse? But yeah, first of all, first and foremost, again, always use a solar filter and actually do some research and be sure it's an a real approved solar filter, not just an ND filter or anything like that. Um, really invest in a proper filter. Uh, it needs to be at least 16 stops. Uh, photographers will know what that means, but um, but yeah, it has to be not just an ND filter, a real solar filter. Um, and I should mention too, the the most, uh, the soonest in October, very soon, almost a month away, is the annular eclipse. And I want people to know that annular eclipses are not total eclipses. So the, the moon is a little bit further from the earth, which means that the moon looks a little bit smaller to us. So that means um, it's kind of crazy that our eclipses from here on earth, the sun and the moon, even though the sun is much larger than the moon, they actually happen to be the exact same size from our perspective, which is just another crazy coincidence that must be super rare in the universe. Anyway, for annular eclipses, the moon is on its further orbit, further away, so it doesn't fully cover the sun. So it looks like a ring of light, a ring of fire, a lot of people call it. Um, that you absolutely can never, you cannot take your eclipse glasses off during that entire moment. You cannot take off the filters, anything like that. It's 10,000 times brighter again than totality. So just I just wanted to put that out there that the the eclipse coming up in October is not the same thing as totality, but I do it is incredible though to see you know big ring and all of that. So I do encourage people to still go to the path for that. But um, anyway, so I for actual uh, SLR cameras, um, you know more amateur professional type equipment, I recommend shooting in raw. Uh, which is basically a really, really high quality image as opposed to JPEG, which is really compact um, uh, and processed. And uh, definitely use a tripod. The moon and the sun do shift a little bit. So depending on how zoomed in you are, you might have to adjust a little bit during totality. Um, I recommend using a remote or setting it on a timer to take its own images on its own. Um, also that prevents camera shake. Um, I also recommend kind of learning how to use the manual settings. If your camera is just on full auto, then the camera's computer is making the decisions for you on, is this bright enough or not? Is this dark enough or not? And that means not only all are all of your images going to be different. Every time you take an image, it's gonna recalibrate and decide. And once totality hits, the lighting changes pretty drastically. So I recommend, manually setting, you know, the brightness and everything practice beforehand, uh, you know, just a, a regular day, uh, you know, put, put eclipse glasses on or put a, a filter on your camera and just practice because whatever exposure you, you use on a regular day when it's not an eclipse is the same exposure you're going to be using during all, all the partial phases. Um, and let's see. Um, uh, oh, I recommend bracketing images. Bracketing means, uh, you know, you take a series of images, you know, three to seven images or something, and and they go from darker to brighter. And that's what I did during the eclipse flight because the lighting is changing so quickly and all that. So every shot I was taking, it was bracketing seven different images at different exposures. So then you can go back later and find the best ones, you know, that has the most detail of the sun's atmosphere and things like that. If you want to take it a step further, I recommend people learn something called white balance, which is basically telling the camera what white is. Our brains do it automatically. So 
you don't want the camera deciding that for you because the sun could look really yellow or red or blue even, you know, depending on what your camera decides to do. So I recommend just trying to learn if you really want to do it the right way, learn how to do decide, make all those decisions yourself instead of the camera making those decisions for you. And, um, and also the, I think the biggest thing is when totality happens, take the filter off, take your glasses off. You know, there's a lot of people that have traveled all the way from who knows where to the path of totality and totality hits and it's pitched like that's your opportunity to see the sun with your naked eye. And there have been people that have not taken their eclipse glasses off, which is great. That means they're being extra safe, but that's when, you know, <laughs> just want to make sure people know, yeah, to take the Absolutely. eclipse. Absolutely. And yeah. I think and I think it's important to mention again because we at Prevent Blindness are focusing on both of them. I think it's important to reiterate what you just shared. Totality only happens during the total eclipse and not the annular eclipse that's coming up in October. And the total eclipse will be in April of this year. And as you mentioned earlier, those aren't around very often. The next one's in the 1940s, excuse me, the next one's in the 2040s. Yeah. So maybe there'll be um some young kids now that are getting excited about um, growing up and taking pictures of the one decades from now. Um, so what, one last question. Uh, many people travel to see eclipses. I know I know plenty who are already making plans um, a year in advance um, to get the best possible view of the event. Do you have any other advice for people to help them get the most out of the experience of watching an eclipse? Oh, for sure. Other than uh, having control over a pilot and the FAA. <laughs> and... Yeah. <laughs> the one good part about being on an airplane is that you're over all the clouds, at least. So that's the biggest risk, uh, you know, viewing an eclipse is that there's a chance that clouds could come in and block the view. So I would say, you know, First of all, make sure you look at an actual eclipse map of, of the, the eclipse in April or October. And, um, you know, there's really detailed maps that NASA has come out with, and you can actually see how long totality lasts for, um, whether you're in the very center of the, of the moon shadow, that's the longest totality you'll get. And the further out you get, it, the totality might only last for 30 seconds as opposed to, you know, three or four minutes. Um, so I would highly recommend to try to get in the most center point of the moon shadow itself, looking at those maps. Also, I would research what the weather history is in different places. Um, what's What place is most likely to have, you know, dry whether, you know, maybe near Nevada or a desert where it doesn't rain often, you know, things like that to consider because, you know, it's pretty, pretty unfortunate when you, you go somewhere and, and it gets clouded out and you miss the whole thing, um, especially how expensive hotels they're getting and stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, I would also recommend being aware of the time of day that the eclipse happens and um, because that'll determine, you know, how high the eclipse will be. And if you are planning on taking photos, um, not just zoomed in shots of the detailed eclipse, but if you want to get some of the foreground, the atmosphere, the environment that you're in, um, you want to kind of think about what direction the sun and the moon are going to be at um, and where you're going to be shooting from and what you want your foreground to be. Uh, I, I went to Chile uh, in 2019 for the solar eclipse that went through Chile and Argentina. Um, and I was on top of a mountain, uh, facing West, uh, or facing, yeah, facing West. And you could actually see from the mountaintop, the moon shadow approaching on the ground. It was very, very cool. Uh, similar to the airplane, but not as, not quite as high up, obviously. Um, but you can see it approaching, which is very, very cool. So if you are able to getting up higher elevation with a view is also very cool. But the bad news about mountains is mountains are more likely to accumulate clouds above them. <laughs> so that's a good point. 
so there's a lot of risk, you know, to decide where where to go. But I, I would at least uh, have a a plan B and a plan C in mind um, that's relatively close by. You know, download some reputable weather apps that that show in detail what the cloud activity is going to be like in the next two hours or three hours. You know, and and be willing to maybe drive out somewhere that that might have a clear sky that's close by. So, um, yeah, those. Oh, and just some bonus things. I would recommend getting some binoculars. Um, again, if you're taking photos, have it on a tripod. Try to have it, you know, taking photos on its own with a remote or whatever that you've preset with custom settings, so that you can enjoy. But binoculars, you know. People underestimate how powerful binoculars are. Um, they really, I mean, if you look at the total eclipse, obviously do not look at it with the binoculars until totality, but um, yeah, looking at a, an eclipse with some powerful binoculars might be worth the investment. Thank, thanks for sharing. I mean, your your joy around these is palpable, and I really appreciate that. So for those watching, please don't forget to visit preventblindness.org backslash eclipse. There you can buy your safety eyeglasses, learn more about how to protect your eyes during an eclipse, and some fun activities to do with your family um, or friends as well. We'll also have information, some of which John shared, on how to photograph and eclipse safely. Thank you.